Uh, I'm Lance Yolof, editor in chief of Mashable, and uh, this is a NPR and Mashable get together, get on the media together. Sorry, I got to get that right. And uh, my uh, very esteemed guest is Brooke Gladstone, who is the co-host and managing editor of On the Media. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Brooke in advance for those of you who are sadly not listening to her show. But uh, Brooke Gladstone is a managing editor and co-host of On the Media. The Long Island native started her career in print. Joined NPR back in 1987 as a senior editor of Weekend Edition with Scott Simon and became senior editor of All Things Considered in 1989. In 1991, she spent a year at Stanford as a Knight Fellow and then reported for NPR from Moscow during Boris Yeltsin's turbulent presidency. After that, Gladstone served six years as NPR's first media correspondent and joined on the media when it relaunched in 2001. She is a recipient of two Peabody Awards, a National Press Club Award. She is also the author of The Influencing Machine, a media manifesto in graphic form listed among the year's top books by New York, The New Yorker, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus Reviews, Library Journal, and among the 10 masterpieces of graphic nonfiction by The Atlantic. Uh, I do suggest that you read it. Uh, please join me in welcoming Brooke Gladstone to the stage. Apparently, am I going to have to use this the whole time? I don't know. Can you hear me all right? I can hear me. Let me see. Uh. Yeah, I guess I have to use this. That's so sad. So, Brooke, how are you? Good. I just want to say that picture is an extreme example of Photoshopification. I apologize. <laughs> Keep telling them not to use it. Well, uh, That's the imaginary Brooke. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you've got, and right next to you is the, the imaginary Lance. So we're, <laughs> we're, uh, we're, perfect, we're perfect together. Uh, you know, I had uh, in my head an idea of how I was going to conduct this interview, but of course we've been speaking for the last 40 minutes in that other room, and uh, I feel like maybe we should let this go a little bit more freely, but I do think it's kind of important, especially for people who are not familiar with your show, just to briefly explain to people what is the role of, of On the Media, like what is it looking at? It's really changed a lot. When, when we, uh, it was launched before I got there. It was a pretty, uh, it was a local call-in show on WNYC, and then it became national, but it wasn't doing anything, and they decided to relaunch it. And that's when I came in uh, the end of 2000. Uh, at that time, it was supposed to be half cultural, you know, entertainment media, trends, that kind of thing, and half journalism watchdoggy stuff. And then 9-11 happened pretty soon after that, and we developed what we called a bunch of stories that we called enabling condition stories. These are stories about things that are required in order for you to get information that is important or for journalists to do their jobs. So we started talking about privacy and anonymity and how to file FOIAs and uh, freedom of information and whistleblower protection and a whole area of media that falls into enabling condition. We still do the cultural pieces. We do uh, parodies. Uh, Bob and I have sung a couple of times on the air. Uh, we desperately try to explain the stakes of stories that people who aren't like you uh, might find almost impenetrable but are still really important. An example might be net neutrality, a phrase so tedious it makes you want to <laughs> tear the flesh from your face. But uh, it's important. There are huge stakes. And uh, we've done this story incrementally over and over again. And once we decided to do a primer, and I was racking my brain for how to make this engaging over 11 minutes, and I decided to set all the big players, you know, the, uh, the phone companies and the FCC and uh, the IPOs, whatever, to uh, ISPs, to uh, different light motifs from Peter and the Wolf. So, you know, the, the grandfather was the FCC and all of them. You kept right. hearing this coming up. And they, they used instruments in the original. Like, wasn't one the oboe and stuff? Yeah, like exactly. That. Right. So, I, I mean, I used exactly right. those themes. And 
I have to say that got um, a mixed response. And that's something, well, <laughs> that is something that kind of weaves through uh, on the media, so a sense of humor, uh, you know, I see in all the reports. I mean, I was looking at the thing that you guys do, which is the uh, media scrutiny theater, uh, which is, which is, by the way. Our foray know, into video. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's online, it's video. I mean, there aren't a lot of them, but they're, it, they're very much like, if you, any of you remember Mystery Science Theater, it's done very much in the same vein. Uh, with it the, was the my silhouette. homage. Yeah, yeah and, and, and well done, but also insightful. I mean, and that's always the thing that you guys kind of try to combine a little bit of lightheartedness with a sort of, you know, pretty laser targeted analysis of what's actually going on. But you talked about starting, you know, kind of really coming back or relaunching the show in early, you know, like 2000, 2001. And this is really the start uh, before the social media revolution existed. Uh, and, you know, the, the enabling technologies were even there to, so, so can you, what things, what major things have changed in the way on the media approaches stories to, to kind of speak to what's happened over the last decade? I was, uh, we did something on our 10th anniversary looking back to what were we talking about then? What was the cool thing? And, you know, it was so stupid. It was special features on DVDs. Wow, now you can see outtakes. You know, this was like the most amazing that thing stuff. that they were doing. I mean, I do too, but now it just seems like we must have been doing it for 50 years, not for just barely over a decade. Uh, you know, there wasn't any Google News. There wasn't any Twitter, obviously. There wasn't Facebook. Uh, you know, when I was, you know, I was still a big fan of, you know, Dogpile and Alta Vista just shortly before entering that show. No, it's and, more than uh, lights and all, all, all of those search engines. It was, uh, it was an entirely different world. And because there were a few uh, avenues into it, you could almost feel like you were a master of it, at least if you were ahead of your friends, and I always was, so, and I, I don't call myself an early adopter because I was very quickly overtaken uh, by all the developments that happened. And, you know, I remember we were talking about blogs, you know, what are their, in, what's that impact going to be? And, and now it, they seem, in a sense, they're not important. It's just another way to talk to each other on the internet. There was this fascinating study that was done, and this is what informed, to get back to your question, actually, <laughs> there is a sort of an answer to your question, okay. uh, which is there was this fascinating study that Pew did about uh, people under the age of 20, and, uh, and it seemed like they were using the, they asked them a bunch of questions about how much do they use the internet, and they, they said, and Judging by their responses, they were using it less until you dug in and realized that there were all these things they were doing online, texting their friends, updating their <laughs> Facebook pages, that they didn't count as being on the internet. Right. They thought that that was, you know, that unless they were doing a Google search, they weren't online. That is how integrated it's been to our lives. And the, the divisions that have been made over the last decade between old media and new, I believe, are obsolete. I think it's an old way to talk about things, and that's changed how we do the show. So that is something I wanted to talk about, uh, and this is kind of how this changed my thinking on, on our chat, is uh, I started reading your book, uh, you know, I want to get the title right, because The Influencing Machine, I'll keep saying that because I think it's really, uh, really interesting, but reading it, reading it, the, the takeaway, one of the big takeaways is uh, there's nothing new under the sun here. And I, I kind of want to dig into that a little bit. What, it, what does it really mean? Why is it that so many people keep talking about, oh, the, the, the revolutionary change of social media and new media, and everything's different, but it's really not? Well, it sort of depends what you mean. What isn't new under the sun is bad journalism, <laughs> unchecked journalism, uh, unethical journalism. That was not invented uh, online. And, uh, and nor was a desire to reach tiny little splinters of audience rather than massive quantities of audience. That kind of thing actually is, occurs cyclically when politics and technology collide. I mean, we had, uh, you know, what people referred to the golden age was actually, you know, a blip. 
Uh, mostly it's been a fractious, fractured media environment. It was just when, for a brief moment, instead of technology getting cheaper, technology suddenly got hugely expensive and required mass audiences to support it. Obviously, I'm talking about television. And at the very same time that television was going off the ground, requiring mass audiences and therefore creating a large middle and marginalizing outsiders and outliers, at the same time we had a political environment that could not handle any dissent because of the Cold War under existential threat. So they were marginalizing outsiders and they were also licensing television and regulating television. So you got this great big consensus middle which created a kind of public square and you had to participate. Everybody tuned into Walter Cronkite. You know, can you imagine how ludicrous it would be if anybody ended their news broadcast today with a statement like, and that's the way it was, that, the way so, that he did. It's unbelievably arrogant. So, so there is a... <laughs> <laughs> you seem angry about that, but it's no, still... No, I, I wish I could have been here. I, uh, <laughs> I, do think, I do think that, you know, you sort of, the cycles of, of the development of new publishing technology Groups come together, it's relatively expensive, people gather around it, it's a central distribution. This happens time and time again over centuries, right? We see this, you know, the invention of printing, the printing press, the invention of radio, the invention of television, but it feels different now. It, it is it feels different now. Sp spread out, like there is, no, there is no center anymore. And I want you to answer that. And I want one other thing that I want to know from you is that do you consider social media a kind of like accelerant, like almost kerosene on some of the things you talked about, like the sort of fracturing of opinion? What do you, what do you think? Uh, yes. Anytime <laughs> you open up ways uh, for people to communicate in instantly, uh, without boundaries, you have an accelerant. It's a, it's a great metaphor, actually. Um, so, yes, that is certainly the impact. But I do believe that overall, what uh, this great digital world has done is enabled us to be more of what we were going to be anyway. Uh, you know, there have been studies that, you know, people keep asking, are we more better informed now or are we less informed now? And what they determined, I think this was a Harvard study, I wish I could cite it, but uh, what, what was determined is that the people who were interested in information were way more informed than they were 30 years ago. And the people who weren't interested in information were l way less informed than they were. Why is that? Because now they're not watching Walter Cronkite. Once they had to, once they had at least a half hour nightly newscast, however bland it was, it was something that people shared. Now you can live your entire life and consume nothing but gardening and sports and, uh, and uh, function in the world. And, and, media, and media that's tailored to your, in, one, interests and to your sort of belief structure. You know, what, the way you think things are going to, are, are in the world is the media that you right. seek out. Right, yes. And, and what's happening with that? What, you know, is that... You is mean that the echo chamber? Right. Uh, Pew did a study once that found that the more literate, digitally literate people were, the more they could negotiate that space, uh, the more likely they were going to bump into accidental information or in the lingo, in the parlance of our age, serendipity. Uh, that you would see things that you weren't necessarily looking for. Something that you might have done if you looked at the daily paper and, uh, you know, normally you don't really care about a sto stories about the Congo, but there's a fascinating story on the front page about the Congo and you read it and then suddenly you realize you do care about the Congo. Uh, that sort of accidental encounter with information is very hard to get online unless you engineer your media diet to provide it. Right, you have to spend the time seeking out all of these different platforms and, and you or, know, they, or the, uh, go to serendipity engines, like browser.com, three quarks daily, arts and letters daily, I mean, but, you know, slate. Right, but that's not what a lot of people do and you know, mm -hmm. we have the, the, two, the thing that you mentioned, you know, this, this ease of entry, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's incredibly easy for anyone to become a, a so-called reporter, right, a citizen journalist. 
And a lot of times what they'll do is maybe create a blog, but that blog, speaking to your point, is about maybe sort of a single point of view or a single topic. And then people become fans of that, and they read it over and over again. I mean, in all the stuff that you've covered and on the media, have you seen, I mean, you've mentioned some sites, but you know, have, you, have you seen some or heard of solutions that start to break people out of, of those? Of their echo chambers? Yeah. Like they used to be out when? <laughs> I mean, you know, they've, they've always been in echo chambers of one kind or another. Uh, you know, I think it, again, going back to my point about the internet makes you more of what you were going to be anyway. If you're curious, you'll, you know, you'll find it. You know, there are, Clay Shirky says that we, our problem isn't information overload. It's filter failure. You know, there's tons of information when you go into a public library or a bookstore. But you know how to negotiate those places. You don't, uh, you know, there's that classic feeling online of, you know, I don't know who said it 20 years ago, that it's like trying to drink from a fire hose. Right. And so, uh, so how do you deal with filter failure? Well, the difference is that you can go to a, you have the option of using a already filtered site that you think offers high quality information, you know, the New York Times maybe, or, Ooh. you know, or you can create your filters by creating a Twitter feed full of people who will aggregate for you, who have a wide variety of interests that right. overlap, coincide with yours. Pew found that the bigger your circle online was, uh, the, the more weak ties you had, not close friends, but the more weak ties you had, the more likely you were to talk to somebody of a different race, of a different uh, um, political persuasion, uh, you know, just outside your sphere. Right, and of course you've seen that people, you know, when they do this, uh, they create their Twitter list or they create who they're following and they think they know them or they think they know their perspective and when they step outside that perspective, they kind of freak out or they attack them. So they don't really like to do what you're saying. They don't think they are doing what you're saying. What do you think about a site like Google News, which is a sort of brainless aggregator? You know, it's just a computer, but it is information from all over the place. Uh, does that fit your model or is that not good enough? It's not curated. It's not, it's, it's a choice. I mean, it's one that I'll, I use, but not exclusively. I mean, if you used Google News all the time, you'd be reading stories from China news services constantly uh, because, uh, you know, there's many people who go to those sites, even though, you know, I'm aware of how a lot of that news is assembled and I don't regard it as necessarily trustworthy. So, you know, Google News is fine, but still you need to know what you're eating. You know, look at the label. So, <laughs> there should be ingredients, right? On every news site there should be ingredients. So, so speaking, speaking of trustworthiness, let's talk about truth. Uh, you and I talked a fair amount about, uh, you know, you talked about the Photoshopification of, uh, you know, the world and, and the recent phenomenon, uh, Sandy, obviously. Uh, the, the photos that people were sharing willy-nilly that weren't real. I mean, what is the, what is the impact on the, the malleability of, of media and, and truth? <laughs> Take your time. Uh, um, okay. The problem with a lot of the faked pictures uh, about related to the Sandy Storm is that they were, they were sometimes produced in advance. They were, they were produced to create a certain attitude, a sense of anxiety. They were put on Facebook pages, shared among friends. They weren't necessarily uh, intended to deceive at all. They were fully labeled when uh, many of them, not all of them, but many of them when they uh, first appeared. But when tweeted and retweeted and retweeted, those, those qualifications, those labels it's go like away. It's like the important tale of information gets lost. Yeah, Just yeah. the head's there. Just the head's it. there, and it gets like a Xerox, less and less information as it goes. So you've got a problem of information that you, don't, you aren't able to track to its source. Now, uh, there was a website in, in London that was doing exactly that. They were taking Sandy pictures and examining them. And they found that it didn't actually take more than, say, 
20 minutes a picture to find out exactly where it came from and who produced it. Uh, it's, uh, it isn't so hard. You might not want to take the time, but then you just, you know, caveat emptor. You know, this is a different world in every single way. I mean, we make choices about things our parents never had to make choices about, whether it's your uh, insurance or your pension or paper or plastic or, uh, you know, what kind of cancer surgery you're going to have. There's really nothing that you aren't presented with a slate of options. And this is, in, in some ways, the most important because it shapes who you are. And if you think passively that you can just sort of take it in and it's all going to be all right because someone else is kind of dealing with it somewhere else along the chain, you're just wrong. That's just not how it works anymore. I mean, it's a little scary because I feel like, I mean, part of what you're saying is I, I don't know who to trust. I, I have to look at every piece of information and do that. that but gut, you do. That there gut are, there are. But, well, you, okay, you say that there are, but who, so who, who do we trust? Where, where, yeah, when we know that a, that a service like Reuters can deliver misinformation or a service, you know, like a, 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 a press release company that has been delivering truthful press releases for years can just kick out something completely erroneous, who do we trust? I mean, and, the, and of course, they all get passed along instantly on social media. Right. Uh, no one's record is perfect. I mean, who do you, who is right most of the time? Who, who operates under principles that you respect as, uh, as being relatively reliable? Does, does, does uh, On the Media give like any kind of, do you do that, that check and say, you know, this is a site that we're going to give the, the On the Media mark to? They're, they're right 85% of the time. No, we don't have. You could start. We don't have the ability to, to do that kind of uh, analysis on our little public radio show. Um, you know, who do you think we are, Nate Silver? Uh, um, it's uh, that kind of meta analysis would require, first of all, trying to determine. Uh, you know, aside from the more. Uh, blatant mistakes that you were describing, you know, what is right and what is wrong. I mean, we did an exercise on the program of trying to figure out whether NPR has a liberal bias. We used every measure we could find, every, every measure that made any attempt to evaluate the media and had NPR in the mix. We broke out their numbers, we did this, we did that, you know, we came to a conclusion. People will still not agree with it, so. You just came away with the conclusion that you're rational. Uh, yeah, perfect. that we're rational and cowardly, I think, because <laughs> what they found is uh, NPR tends to stay away from hot button issues. As a result, it, uh, it is less inflected, tends to spend more time on foreign oh, issues oh. than, you know, gun control or abortion. I mean, do you think it's that so, or do you think you're less inflammatory? I mean, that's. It, it, uh, the, the study that the Project for Excellence in Journalism did and, and found NPR to the uh, more centrist than either the New York Times, the Washington Post, or the pre-Murdoch Wall Street Journal uh, uh, dug into those more and found that partly it's because of the subjects that NPR engages, uh, spends more time on are less likely to be inflected a right-wing or left-wing issue, so, like foreign news. So are you, are you at all concerned uh, with the speed with which information disseminates now? You know, good and bad. You know, as soon as something happens, uh, someone dies, someone does something, or they don't do something, it's on Twitter and it's spread instantly. It, do you think that's generally a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it's a thing. It exists. <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, it's uh, baked into the business, and it's baked into us as human beings to want to know things as, long, as soon as we can know them. Uh, it does certainly create a greater opportunity for error. Those errors get corrected, but the corrections rarely uh, have the impact that the original stories do. It's... Uh, it's too bad that you can't have more effective corroboration, but 
technology that makes things so instant can also, and, and this is really, really crucial, uh, NPR, and, I, and I'm not plugging them, but there's this guy, you probably know, Andy Carvin, who's uh, done something really unusual, which is a real-time news feed based on tweets. And what he does is he triangulates with tweets, and he confirms from when he's got a big enough following so that he can confirm an event from several different sources. He can ask the tweeter to provide more information, and then he posts it. So it is as close to as it happens and as respected uh, a curated side of news in, in absolute split-second time as you can find. It's, it's a staggering achievement. It's something really new. And, uh, you know, we'll be seeing more of that. And people who care about quality information, that is to say reliable information, will, uh, will collect at those sites and help participate to make them even better. So we have just a very short amount mm -hmm. of time left, but what do you think is the next big thing in media? It's okay to say me. <laughs> the next big thing in me, you know, of all the things we talked about before we came on, you couldn't have clued me into that one. Uh, I think the next big thing in media is precisely those Andy Carvin type sites. It is absolutely new. It takes crowdsourcing, which has had some remarkable results, but spotty and only occasional, to uh, a, a whole new level. It is the, the perfect uh, blending of, of professional um, checking and standards with using uh, a, a huge body of well-intended, well-informed people. I think that that is where you'll, you will see uh, the next great strains of information coming from. Do you do you think citizen journalists fall? Are they something that's... Citizen jur journalists, to me, Lance, is kind of a... It's, it's just a, a term that people came up with which, you know, is kind of designed to piss off professional journalists. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I don't see the, uh, the difference between uh, a citizen... I mean, a citizen journalist is anybody who tweets from Terrier Square. A citizen journalist is anybody who posts on YouTube, uh, you know, a, a, a flattened house after Sandy came through. Or, you know, these are all just citizens. Right. So we're, we're all just storytellers and now we have a platform. Yeah. Basically. And, and you know, Brooke, I, I love the stories you tell on On the Media. I love listening to it. I love the show. Thank you. Um, I think the book is really actually an achievement. I know it came out last year, but really something excellent. And I want to thank you so much for taking time to talk to me. Well, Brooke thank Gladstone. you for inviting me. Thank you.